you fail to understand, then the same incredible terror that's menacing me will strike at you! Hey guys, thanks for stopping by. I'm really happy today. I've got Mike Brown with me. Mike reached out uh, to me a few days ago. He wanted to talk with me about his mom, uh, who I knew quite well for a while, his mom, Rosemary, and I think we're all familiar with his story. We're going to get into a little bit of that today. Mike is one of the young people, uh, relatively at the time, younger than uh, than me, that I was uh, privileged to, to meet and, and get to know. Uh, a Sea Org members when I was working at the International Base as a director for Golden Earth Productions. So I'm going to bring Mike in and let's make him feel really warm and welcome. <laughs> hey, Mike. Hey, Mitch. Hey, thanks Anyways, for having me tonight. Yeah, hey, no it. problem. I really appreciate you calling me. So uh, first of all, just tell us a little bit about who you are, for those who don't know, uh, okay. which is a couple of people living under a rock because you've been making yourself very known lately, <laughs> telling the story of how it. you rescued your mom. Uh, so yeah. And how we met for sure. Um, so, uh, my mother joined, uh, Scientology when I was 10 years old. Well, she was in Scientology before that, but joined the sea organization. Um, and then, uh, we moved to California. I grew up, um, at the international, um, ranch for kids. Uh, it's the, the international ranch, we called it, or the Castile Canyon school, and then ended up working at golden era productions for a number of years. Um, my mother was, uh, working at the international base, um, for, un, uh, working for some executives. And, uh, I was married and, uh, to a makeup artist who actually was on your shoe crew. Um, right. Somebody Samantha. that I knew very well. Yeah, it, probably her name still is Samantha, but she's not Samantha Brown anymore. She was no, Samantha yeah, no, Brown. we call her Sam. Um, yeah, I should have brought. So, I have a photo of her. I should have brought it in. But oh, there you go. Well, if you want to, um, yeah, I'll find her. Uh, go ahead. So, continue, Mike. So anyway, I uh, I ended up leaving the uh, the international base in Golden Era Productions, um, what Scientologists refer, refer to as blowing. I blew in uh, 2003, and I was about 27 years old and had to start my life over. Uh, I didn't, other than a GED, I really didn't have any credit history. I didn't have any um, any resume to really fall back onto because it was all of the time that I had worked. I had worked for Scientology in their uh, in their manufacturing divisions of Golden Era Productions or working for executives being their assistants. So it's not like I could use them as a reference moving into the world. Um, early on in my life, I wanted to uh, be in the military when I was about 15 years old. And because I was in Scientology, I wasn't permitted to leave. They, right. uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a teenager, they kept me there until I pretty much decided to stay. So when I'm now 27 years old, a little behind the power curve for usually <laughs> enlisting in the military, <laughs> I decided to do that. So it was kind of starting with not a whole lot. And um, I got myself going on that and I've had a very successful military career. Um, and um, more recently, um, was able to reconnect with my mother. So from the point I left in 2003, up until 2021, she and I had fallen out of contact with one another because when a person leaves Scientology, they're kind of put on a bad guy list. Uh, Scientology doesn't like them and then makes their members disconnect from them because we're considered suppressive persons because we have a, a differing viewpoint on the way we should be living our lives. Um, as such, I fell out of um, contact with Rosemary, my mother, and we um, weren't able to see each other. The only times that I was able to see her was uh, at a maybe a f uh, funeral for my grandmother, her mother. I saw her briefly. Um, and other than that, there was very little interaction. In uh, 2021, I was notified um, by one of my uncles that uh, my mom was uh, in uh, the intensive care unit in a hospital close to uh, the big uh, Scientology base in Hollywood and that she was expected to pass away. They said she had a stroke, she wasn't doing well. So I, I expected that would be the last time I would get a chance to see her. Um, there was one other time that I was able to kind of see her under similar circumstances in the hospital. And that was back in 2011 when she had to have heart surgery. And I, you know, went through all sorts of contortions. Uh, I was in Afghanistan on a deployment at the time and my chain of command was able to let me uh, travel back to the United States so that I could be there with her a couple of days while she was in the hospital before she went back um, 
into the care of uh, the people she was working with in the C organization. So in 2021, now kind of fast forwarding, now I'm, I think that this is our goodbyes and I go out there just to see her. It's during COVID. So getting in and out of hospitals is always, it was a lot of fun at the time. Um, lots of restrictions. Um, but I find out uh, when I went out there that um, she, w she didn't have a stroke. She was just very badly dehydrated and had pneumonia. She didn't really receive follow-up care while working in Scientology. Uh, for her heart condition and had pretty much been worked almost to death. Um, we were expecting her to pass away. She was in, in and out of the intensive care unit for about 45 days. Uh, during this time, she was still working for Scientology in that they had complete control of her, um, her legal affairs, um, like they were her powers of attorney. And I didn't really have any rights or ability to help her. And she wasn't in the mindset of thinking that she wanted to leave. So she was eventually placed in hospice um, in Glendale. And when she was in hospice, had uh, been able to get um, a, a, like a Samsung tablet that was one of these Amazon Fire. Um, right. Yeah, one of those. And uh, she started surfing the Internet. So she's looking for all the great things that Scientology was providing to the world, as um, all these Sea Org members are being told. And she started to find very much the opposite of that. So she ended up sending me an email, which at first I was like, they don't have emails and she would never write to me. I wasn't sure if I would ever hear from her again, but she started to slowly communicate with me. And I started helping her find um, information online where she's able to see stories that people she personally knew had shared. Um, a good example of that is uh, all the Jeff Hawkins sharing his story um, on uh, Leah Remini's uh, Scientology in the Aftermath with uh, that she did with Mike Render, that whole series, the three seasons of it. She watched all of those things. Wow. She uh, read Leah's book and then she read Jenna Miscavige's book. And um, strangely enough, she actually took care of Jenna when she was young because she was a secretary for Ronnie Miscavige. Right. Um, so slowly she got deprogrammed in her story. There, there's a lot of different, uh, abuse that she was subjected to. Well, uh, well working for Scientology, um, that was horrific. But when she became an elder, um, over the age of 65 started receiving social security payments, they started really collecting money from her through all sorts of illegal schemes, opening credit cards in her name, running up other people's credit cards and making her pay them back. Um, taking money from her directly while she was working for them for services that she should have been receiving um, as part of their counseling as a, as a matter of her employment. And she just, they were just taking money because they want, they needed the money for the week statistics all told. Um, this is, this is while she gets paid about $50, uh, $50 a week or sorry. Yeah. $50 a week. That's really all they get paid. They kind of live communally and it's, you know, sort of this religious brotherhood or however they think about it. Um, but the idea is you're supposed to reap the benefits of everything Scientology is trying to offer to the world. And I really thought that she was in a location doing something that she loved and that, that she was being taken care of and she was happy doing it. And um, her First Amendment rights were important to me. Of course, I wanted to be in contact with her, but she was the one that decided to kind of be out of contact with me um, based off of the Scientology rules of disconnection. So when I slowly start finding out about all of these things that are uh, unraveling while she is also starting to realize that, hey, I was lied to all of these years and finding out the, the truth of what actually was going on, um, she got to the point of watching the documentary Going Clear. Um, there was, wow. um, and then that was the thing, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was like, I'm because at that point she was still convinced that L. Ron Hubbard was still good and that all of the things that were going on were despite what he wanted. And that helped her kind of realize that this guy is in fact selling, you know, just a bunch of lies. And now that's just being perpetrated forward, even though he's already passed. So she, at that point would realize like, I, I don't want to be here, but she's in a, in a convalescent home. Um, well, actually in hospice, but she's slowly starting to recover. She's now on oxygen. She's seeing a cardiologist and a pulmonologist. She's starting to get better. Um, and if she got better to a certain point, the fear was they would move her out of that and move her back under a little bit more direct control where she wouldn't have the freedoms to talk to me and be able to leave. Right. 
So long story short, and, um, and there's quite a bit of details to it, um, which you can find on my channel. And I've talked to, uh, I'm sure some of your audience has already heard it, but um, through the help of the Aftermath Foundation and some very close friends, uh, we were able to help her escape and got her moved out of there. She's now in a very good place, um, very safe, uh, living close to me in a very uh, um, upscale assisted living facility where she's being properly taken care of the way that she should be. And uh, a lot of help, both um, physical and monetary, came from the Aftermath Foundation in order to help cover those expenses because uh, it, anyone who's had to deal with uh, senior living needs, it is uh, very expensive. And um, that's not something that I was financially in a position to be able to help her with. But um, the foundation, just without question, uh, was instantly there to help us in every way that we needed it. So. We got her there and we were able to get her legal representation. And as soon as we started a, um, trying to have a dialogue with Scientology through the lawyers, which they refused to talk to her after many efforts that she made, they realized the extent of the crimes that they had committed and they almost threw money back at her. Like like the, the money that they had yeah. taken and even things that were hard to prove, just um, they're almost terrified because they know just how insidious what they were doing was and anyway there's a lot to that but that's that is probably in a nutshell uh the story that i'm trying to share and mm -hmm. what's unique to my mother is um her story but the actual occurrence of what's happening there is being um perpetrated on many other elderly so mm -hmm. a lot of the people i grew up with their mothers and fathers and you know my friends and people that were older than me that i worked with are now mm -hmm you know, getting older and there is no plan in that C organization to take care of elderly people. Right. They they're taking their money and they're working them to death. And I was fortunate enough to be able to help my mother and to reconnect with her. But there's so many other people that are not. And these and so I'm I'm kind of blowing the whistle on this. So I'm, mm -hmm. you know, sharing the story everywhere that I can. One thing I found about uh, the internet is though you can go and search things all the time, unless you're having an active dialogue about things, it seems like the internet and news media and things of that nature have a very short memory. So I can, if I can continue to share this, the, the goal is to help those who are unable to help themselves because of their, their age, the, their physical limitations, the situation that they're in. And if, even if they don't leave, I want Scientology to know loud and clear that we know the things that were done to these people and they need to make it better. Right. So, right. And we're here to support you and telling that story. And you're now a part of a community that really cares. You mentioned the mainstream news and so forth. And there's certain stories like this. They're never going to get the coverage, but because of the advent of YouTube and so forth, these smaller stories that are hugely important that greatly affect people's lives, uh, can actually get some exposure. And while we're at that, before we move on, let me just bring up, this is Mike's channel, Mike Brown. You can find him at Mike Brown 101. So please go to his channel and subscribe. Um, he's, it's important that we spread the story, not just for, for his mom, but for all the other elderly Sea Org members that are out there. Uh, so there you go, there you have it. Thanks, Mike. So- Thank you. You're very welcome. So in, in respect to, our discussion today, I first met, now, what years was that when you said you were at the internet? When did you start at the international base? You started at the ranch. What year was that? So, I'm trying to get a fix. So in, um, to give a timeline, I think we got to, um, to Los Angeles around um, 1987, 88 timeframe. It's right around the time where the Dianetics campaign, right. and that's when a I, very popular one, was started blowing up. And that was... And originally, um, my mother, uh, after she got through her initial Scientology Sea Org boot camp, um, worked as a uh, secretary for um, their marketing executive, um, a gentleman named Ronnie Miscavige, who is David Miscavige's uh, older brother, who was in charge of their marketing unit at the time. And that was Central Marketing Unit. It was located in the big blue building on the right. third floor, I believe. No, I think it was the second floor. I think it was, yeah, the, it was, actually, yeah, it was the second floor. The artists were on the sixth floor. And then yeah, the they were up in like the, the top of the building and then down lower was the actual one of the wings was central marketing down there. Yeah, where uh, Ronnie Miscavige was and Jeff Hawkins was and uh, Carolyn Mustard. Caroline, Bill yeah, Dindu. 
yeah, I build all the your, artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Carrie uh, Cook and you know mm -hmm. some, some other people. Um, yeah, so that's when I met Rosemary was when I think I probably went to work on the Dynamics campaign just, just before she came there. Because you said it was... It, you worked on that with Jeff Hawkins, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did all the TV ads. That. Well, I did all the ones... Okay. The, the ones that everybody remembers. Yeah. And so I didn't interact with Ronnie a lot because he was pretty hands off in terms of my participation. And he mm -hmm. always seemed to me super on the surface to be a nice guy. He didn't have at least uh, like, I don't know what he was like across the whole sphere of his existence, but in terms of our day-to-day -day interactions, uh, he didn't make me feel uncomfortable the way Miscavige always did even when I was, you know, quote unquote, Dave's friend. Uh, and I was yeah, in good I with, him. with that. He's, yeah. he's definitely, um, my remembrance of Ronnie, it's, uh, it's kind of a dichotomy of emotions with him. I can both remember him as, um, my friend's dad, who was mm -hmm. actually quite nice to me and in general, um, trusted my mother very much and had her working for him as, um, his secretary for mm -hmm. over a decade. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the relationship between Ronnie and Dave, you know, and I'm sure Ronnie's going to gets a lot of um, shit just because of who his brother is, but Ronnie is a much so. kinder, kinder person in general, just in the workplace. Like he, right. he's more charismatic. He's not, he's not just a flaming jerk every single time he interacts with someone. Yeah. He's not there to be the smartest guy in the room to make you feel comfortable. He's, he's not yeah. like Miscavige. Dave is what I call an emotional vampire. So making people, you know, fear them or, or feel less than them, that, that sort of uh, feeds his ego, feeds his need. And Ronnie wasn't one of those people. You well, know, I remember was, like just on the, just an interaction with Ronnie, just as you would come in, he's somebody that if you came into a room, you feel comfortable in order to talk. Like, Hey, I, I can, yeah. I can share a conversation with you without right. the fear of immediate retribution. <laughs> Anytime you talk to Dave, you, you, you have to so carefully craft what you're going to say because it doesn't matter what it is. The guy's going to freak out on you. And that was what it was like working for Dave. You're on pins and needles at all times. Ronnie yeah. didn't kind of have that sharp no. edge all the time. Yeah. And mostly Dave didn't require that you said anything. He just, it was, uh, you know, uh, as I discovered when I then ended up at Golden Era Productions working as a director, uh, I discovered that there's three kinds of meetings, right? That CB, he would, you know, Dave would call you into a meeting, right? And when mm -hmm. you were called into a meeting, you were expected, even me, I was hired there as a professional. I wasn't like a Sea Org member. Um, even yeah. me, like we were expected to hustle, like military style hustle. Like, come on, man, there's a meeting. You know, you're supposed to be there now. You know, it's like um, if somebody put me on alert that I had a meeting, I would probably go pee every five minutes because I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to pee. You're ready, right? And then, yeah. Yeah. So totally ready but i found out there's three kind of meetings at least for me uh what i experienced there's the uh there's what you call a back and forth where you go in and and you're going to talk about something creative and you're going to have this back and forth discussion right and that's mm -hmm. very friendly and you, you don't take notes ever because it's being recorded so they don't want you to take notes the notes just means you're not paying attention right some people take notes because they're nervous then the next one is a shut up and sit down and listen meeting Right. And that's mm -hmm. the things are a little tense. You come in, you shut up, you sit down, you listen. The third meeting is I didn't know the Valley of Death had a conference table. And those are <laughs> those are really ugly. Those are the ones where people got smacked around. So, yeah. anyways, sorry to take your time. I was, that, in, yeah, I was in, no, I was in some of all three of those meetings uh, because when I ended up uh, working at the international base, I was first as uh, sort of uh, assistant. Um, trying to relate it to a more corporate structure. So basically a, uh, a deputy uh, that's, you know, a production officer, I was called an organ organizing officer where you go around and make sure people are getting things done, right, right. but kind of working as a second command to um, one of the executives to go and enforce their, their orders. Which, uh, who, and who, I was, who, who, I'm sorry, whose org officer were you? I'm curious. So, um, I initially, uh, when I was at Golden Era, had uh, right after the studio renovation, Studio One and Two, um, oh, yeah. I was out at the ranch working there. And I started, I was coming to the base doing renovations and they were doing a big reorganization. I was made uh, Steve Willett's organizing oh, sure. officer okay. when, yeah, he was was... In, 
when he was in charge of estates and then he right. became the commanding right. officer of gold uh, and right. I, and he took me up to that position with him. Right. And that was when, just so you guys know, when Mike refers to studio one, two, he's talking about audio studios, not film studios. They have two very, very robust uh, music studios at gold where they do uh, music recording and mixing for films. Uh, so mm. that's what he's referring to. Yeah. And then the final mixes. And anyway, these, right. these studios are state of the art. I mean, most of the stuff they make is, and I'm sure these some of these are probably aged out a little bit, um, but I bet they've updated them. But oh no, they 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 have in Studio One, they have a um, uh, um, they have a mix board built by a guy named George Massenberg, and mm -hmm. I think there's only four of them in the world, and it's continuously updated. But there's guys in the music business that would literally kill to have that mix board. That thing is, it's oh, it was. That Amazing. stuff is, yeah, none of that stuff has aged out. I mean, what's aged out, It's this is a random uh, uh, trajectory, but it's uh, what's aged out are the uniforms of the class five orgs, okay? Those yeah. Are totally aged out. The stewardess out. look? Yeah, it's a, everybody says that, that they look, but I'll let you in a little, a little inside dope on that. Everybody says they look like, uh, you know, in flight uniforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they were designed, I'm trying to think of his name, I'll look it up. His first name is Richard. He's a very noted fashion designer. The most recent job he'd done before he was hired by the church was he had designed the uniforms for Delta Airlines. So there you go. People are not wrong when they look at those. <laughs> so, but it always, I mean, they look, it always they look business out. professional. Yeah, um, but they also look hospitality. That's they, true. And yeah, I think that's probably a look that they were going after as opposed oh, to completely. That, they were going after you know, a professional gonna, hospitality mm -hmm. look. But the thing is, is I looked at this recently, the cost, the, I keep calling them costumes. I, oh. I don't know. It's because it's almost Halloween. I'm a film guy or they like cosplay because, you know, the Sea Org is all about cosplay, cosplay right. Navy, cosplay hospitality. You know, it's it's just which is which I've learned is a bit of an insult to cosplayers because they're very yeah no you're right that just no, want to have fun but if you're having <laughs> it, it, you're right you have the yeah right but if you're cosplaying I some, I, right <laughs> go ahead Mike <laughs> I got some I caught some flack uh, which is hard not to do because you're sharing that but I I re referenced uh, the Sea Org uh, fake Navy thing is kind of like the LARPing the live action role playing. And right. I had to tone that down. And I have a cousin that's very much into that too. She's like, really, did you say that just because I dressed up and went to the Ren Fair this weekend? And I love the Ren Fair. And I realized that right. is very unfair to people that are just having a good time to try to, you know, but uh, I'm just trying to find a parallel. Yeah. I, know. <laughs> I know this is, I know we're way off on some tangent now, yeah, but, we're... but I'm going to defend you. Okay. On that statement. And I'm telling you because it's a different like cosplaying because you're going to the big comic con so you can prey on children is one thing cosplaying because it truly is a way of rejoicing in the pop culture of you know comics is a different thing okay yeah. so they, they both are cosplay but one is predatory and i think we could say that what the church engages in is let's just give it a brand new name predatory cosplay okay so there you go at least it's differentiated I have mm -hmm. to tell you something funny. I think I might have told you on the phone that when you guys did the stream about um, the military, you and Sterling did a stream about uh, yeah with Aaron, uh, yeah, c contrasting and comparing the military uniforms and so forth. Carolyn Mustard, I was talking to her on the phone, and she said, "You know, when I first got on the Sea Org, they used to send us to the Navy surplus store to get part of our uniform." So, <laughs> like that, yeah, there's that wrong in so many little... ways. Right, right there on Fountain Avenue. It was on Fountain, I think. Yeah, there was yeah. this little crappy military surplus store right next to uh, Peter Gillum's. Um, right, just right. down the road from the the parking structure and stuff. Anyway, and they would have like just the cheapest military looking uniforms and like members only jackets with epaulets, and it was like yeah. super cheesy. Yeah, and people um, would buy yeah. uniforms. Yeah, just to give you some context, Fountain Avenue and so forth, where Mike's referring to, that would be like next door to the big blue building. So this was in that neighborhood. Like this was their their strip mall, right? The Scientology strip mall was basically vitamins, CalMag, and Navy surplus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's get back. Let's get okay. Back so, uh, so I think we were kind of talking about, um, well, the relationship when you were on the Dianetics campaign, but interaction with Ronnie. 
right, um, right. and how that contrasted with Dave so much. Yeah. It, and it definitely did. Um, I, like I was just, you know, people talk about nature nurture, right. Mm -hmm. And it's just like those guys, they were, well, I, mean, I had a brother, an older brother who was a, a bit troubled and people would say we were nothing alike. So I know what you can have siblings who are absolutely nothing alike, but uh, there, uh, you couldn't imagine two brothers being more different than mm -hmm. than Dave and Ronnie. They were just incredibly different, you know, from my perspective. Um, yeah. And Rosemary, I saw her probably every day I went down there. I mean, I I wasn't there every day. I would uh, there multiple times a week for meetings or whatever because you know I was doing TV ads, so I was spending time at at uh, you know video houses and on the set shooting, although a lot of stuff we did was post-production because the the questions ads, which were our biggest success, they were all post-production. There was no shooting or anything involved. Right. Those were just made at a video house. But I would interact with, with Rosemary a lot. And I have to tell you, and I mentioned this to you the other day, but I want I really want to stress this. Rosemary was such a sweet person. She was literally the kind of person that would sort of brighten your day when you talk to her and mm -hmm. but her personality it had the effect which unintended effect by her of sort of normalizing scientology sort of normalizing the sea org because you know if you were having a day when it's like you know this sucks i don't like this and you mm -hmm. you interacted with rosemary you would think yeah but it's okay with her so it must just be me because she was always such a kind of a bright sunny person she was always her uniform was always perfect her hair was always her scarf was always in the right place yeah and she was really memorable like she like there's a lot of people from that period that i have to bang my head against the wall to even get a glimpse of who they were but she's certainly not one of them yeah and i think that um the and this is an interesting point to highlight so many people get into scientology because originally it had kind of this counterculture it had this thing of like you know kind of a free-spirited approach to absolutely you know, uh, self-help like you're going to find that the majority of people that get into scientology probably 99.9 percent .9 of them are some of the best people you will ever meet they yeah. they want the world to be a better place right. and they they were sold a, uh, a bill of goods telling them that this is the way it's going to happen right. Right. and i think claire headley put it in a way that I really love that the days are long, but the years are short and you just kind of, oh, you're, yeah. you're just chewing yeah. through today. And before you know it, years and years and decades start to pass by and you just kind of are stuck in a situation and you just, yeah. it's now your life. But so many people that I worked with, uh, similar to my mom, and I think she's an excellent example of that were just such good natured people, um, that they would, um, kind of, make the day a little bit easier to get through. But another aspect of the Scientology experience uh, in the C organization, Scientology as a public, I assume, was very much similar, is there's no such thing as this sort of um, nuanced interaction that we're having right now. You're not able to get on and share an opinion and to get no. somebody else's counter opinion and kind of argue something out and to come to a mutual understanding. Like, you can't bitch you can't they call it nattering you can't bring up a, a disagreement um because then they'll try to pin it on you as something wrong with you and right. there's just something fundamentally wrong with that so that coupled with such nice people that are there it gives you this internal perspective of these thoughts that you're having about things not quite to be being right um it it makes you think that it's you so right. and then um so yeah, Rosemary worked for Ronnie for a number of years and she was a very dedicated. She's one of these people that absolutely, she loves taking care of other people. So she, right. um, she took care of, uh, obviously all of the work stuff, but then when there was the opportunity to, you know, take care of the kids and most of us were out at the ranch, she would, you know, kind of be going almost as a proxy, uh, for the parents at times, if they couldn't get off to take care of Jenna, take care of Justin. Right. Uh, Sterling, like grab the kids, bring them home so that the um, the parents are able to see them a little bit more. And I was able to kind of tag along. I, I always joke that it seems like the um, the aristocracy or the um, royalty of Scientology between the Hubbards and the Miscavages uh, reminds me of a Game of Thrones. 
you know, it's just so <laughs> yeah, yeah. complicated and it, like everything's pointing yeah, different directions. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, I, except for the power struggle really, because once Dave took over, yeah, that was it. Then it was, then it but was over. In but in terms of the intricacy of the relation of the familiar relationships, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, and that was how, like, because you almost have to like, you need to graph this out in order to make it make sense. Oh but, yeah. I mean, when I think about who Sterling's, I hope this isn't sound offensive, but when I, when I try to think in my mind, okay, now who's his, his parents who raised him? Who the, my brain. Yeah. Creeps so, a little bit, you know, my, so yeah, his, his mother's, you know, uh, Biddy and foster, right. but then he right. was raised by foster and Barbara right. and then, you know, Biddy and Ronnie raised Justin, his twin brother. Right. And so he was Tompkins. Justin was Miscavige, but they're right. both Tompkins. Like you got to like, you like, we need to, uh, yeah. But then and Jen I, is their half sister. I, anyway. Yeah. I always crazy. thought, I, I always thought Barbara was his mom. Like I, yeah. I just, until recently, I always thought that I was, I would have argued with you about it because I knew, well, and, I knew them both. But when Barbara was a CS and case supervisor mm -hmm. at the advanced org of Los Angeles and the time period you're speaking about when I met your mom, um, when she was working with Ronnie, the Foster was kind of over that whole thing. He, and I, I don't remember his role, but he was definitely involved. He was, he was in Incom. Yeah, uh, I thought he was mm -hmm. a bridge. I mean, I guess he was either Incom uh, or bridge. I yeah, know he but, was instrumental in the establishment of Incom. Like, yeah, 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 that, and he was instrumental in getting the Dianetics campaign going. Which that Dianetics campaign is the reason Scientology grew into the '90s and yeah. almost had a chance to get big enough to survive forever like the Mormons mm -hmm. did it, right. until Miss Gavish came along and just like, you know, set the whole thing on fire and just burned it down. Sure. But yeah, Foster was, he had a huge role more so than people know. Yeah, he was. And, and again, a, of an excellent example of a amazingly good natured individual that will do anything to try to, tr right. to help the world in the way he right. thinks um, that he is. And that is, uh, so unique. And like, he'll work for nothing is what these people do. So, um, but I think, so that's when you first met my mom. Um, mm -hmm. and then I know eventually, um, she was, well, they re, uh, posted Ronnie, meaning he was assigned to a well, more I, senior I, executive I, position, right? I'll, t I'll tell you the backstory, I, which I recently okay. found out from hmm. Carolyn Muster, the reason why all of a sudden everybody went up to the end. Um, I'm not, I don't know if you're aware of it, but what happened was we were having incredible success. The Dianetics book from the day it was released in, in, in May of 1950 till whenever that was, when I, when I got called in on it or asked, you know, brought in to work on it, it had sold 3 million copies. That's abysmal. That's the worst performance you can imagine. Uh, and it even suffered one period where, Hubbard even no longer owned the copyright. So then that got sorted out. Right. He was able to buy it back uh, after he went bankrupt originally, but whatever. So then between whenever it was 86 or something, I, I, I got to go on with Jeff sometime and figure this out. Mm -hmm. It was the mid 80s, 86, 87, something like that. Um, I got brought in and I don't, I don't know if Ronnie was there yet. I think he, that, it might have been out of he might have been out of the sea org because he was brought back by his brother to play that role to to have that particular job. So mm -hmm. meanwhile, up at the base, they were desperately trying to make films and do marketing. They were trying to do everything that Hubbard said. They had a film crew, they had a marketing department. They, well, they had no marketing up there. All of marketing was in LA. And so now LA is just explodes a success wise. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. be in, in a few short years, we sell 10 million books. And, and, and the book legitimately gets on the bestsellers list. Not like later when they do these buybacks and they do all these tricky yeah. manipulations. Manipulations, to get right. Yeah, I mean, it was on the New York Times bestsellers list legitimately twice. First time, 1950. Second time in like mid-80s, 88, something like that. And so then, this all of a sudden, Miscavige decides one day, these guys need to come to goal. They up to end. They need to stop working with outside professionals like me. There was another guy named Rick Rogers, who'd been a creative director at Leo Burnett, one of the biggest agencies in the world. He was a Scientologist. We had a gal who was a Scientologist named Jan Gildersleeves. She was a media buyer, and she was the hmm. one that figured out that cable was a brand new medium and that you could buy ads on it cheap. 
and nobody yeah. was. So she, and I remember Jeff talking about that and like, let's get onto this. And it was, it was yeah, pioneering it, at that point, it right? It was a brilliant, it was like, it, like in like three years, they sold 10 million books because they figured out you could get on cable and it was cheap mm -hmm. and you could do ads. And the people who watch cable at two in the morning, those are the people that are going to buy the Dianetics book. They're sitting right. there with their credit card on their bed stand and, and, you know, on a bottle of scotch and they're like miserable. So they're looking for answers. Uh, so anyway, Meanwhile, up at the base, they're just sucking. Like, they can't get films done. Uh, so Miscavige orders the entire marketing department up to gold. And he and Marty Rethman and and who was it? It was uh, uh, somebody else. Oh, it was Norman Starkey. There was, like, this little program. We're going to make you guys that are real Sea Org members. You're going to stop hiring professionals because professionals like me they represent what they used to call external influence. You remember that, Mike? Mm -hmm. that, that's a really dangerous thing. External influence. Yeah, you might you might have an like an a, like a critical thought or an original thought. Like it's yeah, some or, dangerous shit. Yeah, it, it, or you might you you yeah, that is very true. Or you might be attracted to a different way of doing things than Hubbard said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were like, no more working with professionals. We're going to make you guys into real Sea Org members. If we need to do ads, the, sh the gold crew can do them. Okay, so like a year and a half later, the gold crew is locked up in the galley scrubbing the grease out of the fryers because they could get nothing done. And now they, they come to me and then start saying, hey, would you like to come up to gold and make a film? So that's kind yeah. of what happened. Uh, you know, uh, That's why they all ended so up there. And so then Rosemary ended up in housekeeping, right? They, they well, had, originally, so like she did. Yeah, not um, originally. So originally she ended up because she was already working with Ronnie. And when they moved. So this is kind of to uh, recap the way that uh, what you said is there was a tremendous amount of success with the way that it was being done with the marketing campaign in Los Angeles. Right. And the, it was so successful that they had to stop doing it. Yeah, exactly. And to do something completely different, right. which is the dumbest shit did like, like what, like if you have something that's going right, why would you do that? But anyway, Ronnie ends up moving up to this higher level. He goes into uh, an echelon um, of a, um, of international management called senior executive strata. They have all right. these different functions like books, marketing, you know, gross income, all these different people. And they're supposed to do analysis of these things. And they're, you know, wear commander stripes and, they work under the executive okay. director international Guillaume LeServe. Right. And um, they're supposed to kind of have a line into all these organizations to do all these great things and make it all expand. Right. So with that, he moves up to that golden era productions property and Rosemary goes with him. And um, at this time, myself, Justin Sterling, Jenna, Taryn, uh, who Mike renders children, Taryn and Benjamin, mm -hmm. we were all still down in Los Angeles right. and a lot of other kids, like all of the children, uh, that, uh, our parents who worked at that base and there were probably 80 or 90 of us, we right. were just down in LA, right. like hanging out with other families and our, and our parents were like a two hour drive away up at golden air productions. We didn't even know where that physically was because it was all confidential. And anyway, so we end up, um, uh, moving up there eventually to this, uh, ranch, um, along with all of the other kids, but Rosemary then was continuing to work for Ronnie. And while Ronnie was, um, definitely different than his brother, Ronnie was, uh, in this, you know, to kind of, and I know some people have been, you know, probably wondering like, well, what, it, what ended up with Rosemary's situation on how things got worse when she worked for Ronnie, he was really, um, engaged in things which would be considered, you know, uh, sexual assault in the workplace right. and appropriate touching right. and things of this nature. Now, no one knew that, but RTC, the Religious Technology Center, eventually found out about it when they were interrogating Ronnie, and um, and then they ended up punishing Rosemary for it. Um, and then Ronnie was probably in some degree of trouble, but he went back to his job, and Rosemary right. was punished. She was restricted to that base and then kind of put down into a lower job down in Golden Era Productions, um, working... Uh, as a housekeeper and she was in housekeeping right. and she would take care of the VIPs. And that's where you kind of ran into her. I, this was an interesting topic because I talked about this last night uh, in terms of the relationship of this um, abuse. And um, because it's very like, 
it's very emotionally charged. It's emotionally charged for me. It is for Rosemary. And uh, she and I were talking yesterday, and I shared this with Claire and Amy on um, the live that they had me on yesterday. So with respect to, and I've, I've seen my mother working through this, she told me that she never thought she'd be able to admit or tell me the reason why she had gotten in trouble. And like when she was then put in the situation, if she was responsible for these things happening, even though it was non-consensual and she was very much in a junior position, um, people are outraged by that. And right. I, I completely get it. And that is, that's definitely Ronnie's, uh, Ronnie's shit that he'll have to sort out in terms of the perception of people have on him. And I know that I'm kind of dragging the guy a little bit and I, I rightfully so, but the, the reason why I share it isn't necessarily as much about him as the abuser, which that is its own very important aspect of this, but it's the responsibility of, so you're, you have these people working in a church and, um, Rosemary was there as a worker in this organization. And this, such a thing happened with an executive and the, the churches or corporations response to this whole thing was to victimize the victim. Right. And that is the, the, the abuse she suffered as a result of that is in many ways way worse than what happened when it was going on, even though that I don't want to downplay that at all. Right. And this right. is, I kind of feel like I'm walking a fine line trying to even explain this. But, well, um, yeah, I mean, it's understandable because we're talking about somebody who was loved and important and, and, and important to some people. In, and, but in one part of his life made some mistakes that were damaging to other people. Correct. So it's always a difficult subject to breach. People are complicated. Yeah. Nobody's people just are. one thing except David Miscavige, which is he's a, a sociopath and a narcissist. He's one of the rare people that is just one thing. I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. No, that's 100% true. So so when when mom was talking to me about this, she said, aside from working through the actual just, you know, shame and guilt and all that being able to talk about it she also didn't want to talk about it because of fear of uh retribution from the from scientology but also fear that her talking about this would hurt people she cared about right. for instance she very much loves jenna um she's she remembers jenna when she was a little girl and then jenna ended up you know kind of having her own story and she has an absolutely amazing book that she uh, has out where she talks about her childhood uh, her teen years um, and her whole escape story from Scientology. She didn't want to downplay anything by adding any of this into it. And that's right. kind of why I've, I'm harping on a point because um, people need to be able to interact like on this platform and be able to share openly about their interactions with other people, regardless of if the specific nuance has anything to do with another person's story. Um, so for right. instance, if, um, if somebody's talking and they're talking about marketing and Ronnie Miscavige comes up, that, that has nothing really necessarily to do with Rosemary's situation. If Jenna is sharing her story, which she, I absolutely want Jenna to have, you know, a, a platform and a voice to be able to share her experiences because they're very important for her to, um, share. She also needs to know that she has the safety and security to be able to share what she has to say from her perspective, right. because do you think, do you think like any of his family knew that that shit happened? Like, I didn't know, you know, like, and then the, you know, the, the church knew, and then, you know, these two people were kind of, Ronnie was kind of penalized, but sent back to work. And Rosemary was kind of, you know, shunned away in disgrace and eventually went to their thought rehabilitation camp, the RPF for six years, oh. six years. That's like a prison sentence. Like, when, that, I that, that, when I heard that, when I heard that, Mike, I just, when I heard that, I literally, started to cry having known her and imagining her being on the RPF. Yeah. It, it's just, it was, I was like, I was frozen. I was so stunned when I heard that. But she was down there. She was down there with, um, you know, a lot of people from gold. Caroline was on the RPF with her at the same right, time. Caroline right. Mustard. Right. And these are people like some of the most dedicated people that will work tirelessly. Total idealists. Tossed out like garbage. Yeah. Um, because of Carolyn was instrumental know. in selling those 10 million books and mm -hmm. now she's doing whatever, sc scraping the crud out of dumpsters. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and meanwhile, this woman is an absolute powerhouse and she gets out into the world. She's 
it, she can't help but to be successful, like Caroline specifically. And that's the same of everyone who right. is, you know, treated like crap there. When we go out, it was like, hey, we were, we're, we're good people. We can be successful in our own way. And I think there's many, right. many examples of that. Right. So, oh, yeah. Um, sure. So I think the conversation about these things is, I, I, you know, not to just, you know, beat on Scientology, but really the organization. And I, and I used a bit of an analogy yesterday, and it maybe was a good one, maybe not. The military, obviously, and, and corporations in general all have a policy on what you're going to do about what do you have, if, uh, you know, sexual violence or sexual harassment in the workplace, what do you do? So there's at least a program in place. Now, there's there's times where that program has failed and people have not been properly taken care of. But the, the organization, the way the organization responds to those failures is just as important um, as having a program in the first place. That way they can adapt the program, make it more important, make make right. sure that there are lines for people to have advocates to be able to speak out right. and not have retribution against them. Right. So that you're saying, one aspect, yeah, you're basically you're saying at least they have it in policy. The policy may not always be followed, but it's in written policy. It's in like this, this example, military code. Yeah, they have a program in place. So if it's not followed and then something then happens, at least there's there's recourse and action, you know, and, and for every example where it's probably good, there's probably an example where it wasn't done properly. And you could say the same about um, a news corporation that, that has had the same sort of thing happen. Uh, if any major, I'm sure Google has a policy against what they're going to do with a lot of people that work together. And then, you know, if you right. have something bad happen, what do you do? Right. The point is, does an organization have a plan that consists of what are we going to do to protect people in the workplace? Because they're responsible for people that work for them. They have these people like dedicating their time and being paid next to nothing and are living on their premises. Like, are they going to make sure that these programs are in place to make sure that they're safe? And if the, if the, Programs are not in place, which in the C organization, they don't exist. You have the knowledge reports policies. You have some of their like, hey, if you speak out against us, you're a suppressive person. There's not a mechanism for a person no. to say, hey, this happened to me. I need help and not fear that they're going to be in trouble as a result of no. it. All right. So All right. so with that, we want to the the point being um, people need to be able to have nuanced conversation on YouTube. They need to be able to have it and not everything be, you know, kind of chicken picked in terms of like, oh, is this a big deal? I want, you know, anyone to be able to talk about Ronnie. Does Ronnie need to own his own shit? Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. But really the point is an organization on the way that they don't care for somebody, that I think is what the problem, where the problem is persisting in the uh, present time for a lot of people who are still there. Right. So, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes, Mike, I think about uh, the ending of apartheid in South Africa. And when Ma when Mandela became president, they had what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, <laughs> where they said to people, look, if you honestly come forward and you actually divulge all of your crimes, um, we'll forgive you. It was controversial because there were some horrific crimes that were uncovered and people got away. But at least everybody was able to get closure. People were able to find out where the bodies were, what happened to their loved ones. And, you know, sometimes I think some of us need to, like, have a little bit of a yeah. truth and reconciliation. Well, I feel uh, the same way about myself. Uh, and I'm sure you feel the same way, too. Like, we were involved in something for the best reasons. And mm -hmm. due to the climate, have undoubtedly have interactions with people that if looking back at them, you feel ashamed of the way yeah. you probably treated people. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I don't because believe it or not, I know this is terrible to say. I, I uh, you know, I, I was not a bad guy there. What my guilt comes from being like a B 52 pilot who carpet bombed a village. I never looked at any of them in the eye, but I dropped, I helped to drop propaganda on entire populations right. that, you know, like um, Apostate Alex, who I've become very good friends with, he said, you know, Mitch you're the reason I got into Scientology because of those ads and the da da da. So yeah. I mean, do I that, about that is a burden to have to yeah, deal with yeah. that. And, yeah. But I was being able to come out and talk about it, it's got to, I mean, there's gotta be some healing there too. It is. I, that's how it feels for me being able to talk through these things. Well, I, you know, I did this in, in 2014. I helped to produce a video and I was interviewed in it. I was probably extensively appeared in it more than anybody else. It was one of their, look at us, we're going to pull the, the covers off ourselves and we're going to be transparent. It was called Inside Golden Era Productions. It's still on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. 
And while that was going on, the hole was happening, like within 100 yards of, of and I suggest you go to my channel and watch it. It's called uh, The True Story of, of uh, the Church of Scientology's uh, production, whatever, you'll find it. It's one of the only two videos I did because everything else is live. But within 100 yards of where all the interviews were shot for that, the hole was going on. And and the whole everybody at Gold knew about it. I mean, it was a gold. Sure, it was Dave's prison, but it was a gold op. It was run by yeah. security. Everybody knew about it. You know, qual the qualification division, which are there to take care of the staff, they knew about mm -hmm. it. So right. you know, so I, I I recorded that video and put myself in a window and I talked people through it and like mm -hmm. I I made myself accountable and I said this is what's happening right so. And that was kind of scary to me. I didn't speak out for a while because there's people with gold I really care about. I was able yeah. to buffer the crew from a lot of bad stuff. And like you and I have talked about, sometimes you're you're not fighting for the ideology of the nation. You're fighting for the guy next to you in the, in the That's trench. That's totally true. Yeah, yeah, so you care about these people. And so I didn't really want to speak out at first because I care about them. Like, why should I spit in their ice cream? You know, they have a right to live however they want to live. And then you realize... You know, and this is a message, my message to people who are under the radar. Uh, I'm not trying to evaluate you, but sometimes you have to make that hard decision and you have to step out and you have to speak up because that very potentially will bring the day closer where your loved ones and your friends can also get out if you speak out. Although you may have to go through a very difficult period of being disconnected yeah. from them and whatever, because if you don't do that, you're just for, for stalling the inevitable. So anyway, we, we're talking about holding ourselves accountable and uh, that's about all I have to say on it. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, like I'm coming up on 20 years since I left. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually next week is going to be the 20 year to the oh. day anniversary of October 17th, 20 years ago when I like left and didn't have anything and kind of starting my life from scratch. And I, and I have something that I'm very proud of now. I really feel like I've, I I'm, I'm doing the thing that I love. I have a wonderful family and I have, um, nothing but, um, feel like a, accomplished things within that 20 year period that I'm actually proud of. But when I look back at the stuff before and I saw people like, you know, really some of the first ones that started speaking out, um, aside from like the, the the ones that were literally the pioneers of these things um but mark and claire had you know a lot of momentum and mark wrote his book and that's kind of my generation who my contemporaries right. would be right. when they started speaking out and i remember as seeing these things slowly evolve and then the aftermath show coming out and then mike render coming out when mike render came out it was like whoa because I knew Mike, like he was right. my, right. he was my friend's dad. Like I remember right. growing up and Mike right. was the executive there. And, right. um, I had a similar, um, because the first person that actually told me that you left was Roan, and she said, Mike, Mitch left. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I was never left? supposed to leave. Remember Mike? I was one of those um, guys that he'll never leave. Oh, he'll, I, I was convinced like, you know, even though you were in this weird thing and I know you've talked a lot about this, you were, you were, you were, couldn't be deeper in if you wanted to, but at the same time you had a bit of a, they, they did some information control on what you were shown. Right. Um, but you also had unbelievable inside, um, access to things that yeah, no they, one else would really have. Uh, and I remember she told me that and I'm like, I'm like, is he going to start speaking out? And she's like, I'm not sure he might at some point. And I'm just like, Oh, this is huge. So the fact <laughs> you're doing that, I don't know if people understand the significance that you've had in that organization. Like right. you have a, like Mike Render knows all that OSA stuff. You know, all their marketing stuff at the same level. And the so gold organizational stuff. Man. Right. It is, yeah. it is unbelievably interesting to me. Um, the, the magnitude of people like you and people like Mike Render um, coming out. So for me watching these things happen like as mike and lee are doing these and i see you know people that i know starting to share their story it was this um pain inside of me like oh, i've got to mm -hmm. speak out on this but my mother was there and i'm like i'm not going to do anything that's going to speak against even mm -hmm. though i'm a declared suppressive person speak against her that's going to make her situation anything other than what she wants it to be. I literally had it in my mind that she wanted to be there, even though I knew that I couldn't stand the place. I knew she was now working down in Los Angeles. I thought that she was happy and I couldn't have been um, more of an idiot to think that now yeah. in hindsight, looking back, but that I feel is a lot of people are in this situation of like, I don't want to 
take that step to us take a step back from all this and say no because they're scared of who they're going to lose their loved ones in some respect are are very much weaponized against them in order to control the thought because they just don't want that pain of the loss and i think that that is key so no one's sharing these thoughts Every, probably a lot of people are having them i'm not going to say everyone because i think that that I, I have no way to prove that but I, a lot of people must be feeling and sensing the same thing and if just more people would say you know what this isn't for me i don't like what's going on even if they still kind of believe in scientology but they don't believe in the bullshit that's going on with it and just said no i think that you know they they might experience a time of loss but more than likely their loved ones are going to leave too at some point I, that's what i really hope because i want other people to experience getting their families back and it's a very hard thing to try to solve because most of them are in this mindset of thinking that they're stuck there and that they are in the right place and if they just had a little bit of separation from that and are able to think clearly and able to kind of you know think for themselves without constantly being you know kind of fed this line of what to think and how to think that they'd probably make other decisions so I, I agree with you. It's a hard thing to do, but I, I respect you it very is. much for doing it. Yeah, and I'm excited you. to see what you're going to do. So, yeah, I'm going to do more. Well, you know, I have a book coming out. Um, yeah, which is almost done. We're going to try to get it in thing. Uh, I'm going to try to get it not just on Amazon, but into stores uh, sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And oh, believe wow. it or not, do you remember the film, Mike? Do you remember uh, uh, the sci-fi film Independence Day? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and do you remember when the aliens were showing up? And somebody mm -hmm. said, I think it was Jeff Goldblum said, they're using our satellites against us. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's that's us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We are those true. satellites because now yeah. you've we're got, hopping on their signal. Yeah, we're hopping. <laughs> thank you. We're hopping on their signal because we've got me and 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 Jeff Levin, who's done music for me, and we've got Carolyn Mustard, and we've got Carrie Cook, a very talented designer. Uh, who we all knew at, at uh, from the old Dianetics days and from the Infa. She was probably the most successful designer up there. Uh, mm -hmm. Then all of us were like working on projects. Where all of them are helping me with my book and with marketing. And it's like crazy. Every all, That whole team, they're jumping on. So yeah, we're getting yeah. on their signal. You know, when I left, when I finally made the decision, because, you know, for me, it was just a slow motion train wreck that was mm -hmm. accelerated by COVID. And when I finally stopped interacting, I called Jeff, we spoke, because uh, we were dear old friends and I hadn't talked to him in whatever long, decades. And then I called him because I wanted Mike Rinder's number. And he gave, mm -hmm. got me in touch with Mike. And then I called Mike, we spoke on the phone for three hours and he said, you have no idea how much power you have because of what you did for the church. You can now do it against them. But at, the point, at that time, I wasn't in shape to hear it. I went home, I sat on my couch for a year and a half and I played Overwatch. Like literally, I did nothing but vegetate. And then I was finally able to realize that how how much th that path forward, my path forward would be dependent on speaking out. And mm -hmm. so, and I think people don't realize that. Speaking of Rowan, he mentioned Rowan. That would be uh, Elwin Hubbard's granddaughter who was a good uh, contemporary of Mike's. And was a dear friend of mine. She worked in painting in the in the set shop, and and she was always like the daughter I never wanted to have. I mean, when I got to see her, when I finally left, it was just like, it was like a tearful reunion. She's such an amazing person. Yeah, she's very talented. I just had to throw that in. Sorry, but absolutely no. She she was one of the people who um, helped me to physically get my mother picked up from right. the place she was in uh, Glendale and actually help us get to the airport right. and get out of LA. Right. Her and Justin, uh, formerly Justin Miscavige, Justin Tompkins, right. two of my closest friends in the world. And they were right there with me every step of the way. It was amazing. That's amazing. I know. Yeah. It's such a great story. I can't wait for the documentary. Literally. Yeah. It's going to be good. Yeah. No, it's going to be good. I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to over pump it, but anyway, yeah, so speaking of my book, I just have to do a shameless plug and then we'll get back to our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, hold on a second. Let me just put this up here. So uh, I have, where did it go? There it is. I have an Indiegogo campaign. We've met the campaign. Uh, I basically was raising money for the finishing costs of the book. And now we're continuing on to extend beyond the campaign, uh, the, 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 you know, the target. So if you uh, to to 
campaign to raise funds for the marketing campaign because it is my aim to not just get this book on Amazon, but to get it into bookstores. And that takes a little bit of doing because you really have to convince bookstores mm -hmm. by putting a marketing campaign behind it that it's worth them purchasing the book to put in the bookstores. And I've gotten some, some very serious media reaches and that coverage will then help convince the bookstores. So if anybody wants to help that campaign, this is absolutely a book that Church of Scientology does not want released and they don't want people reading this because, you know, this is not about the whole and it's not about people being, you know, physically abused and so forth. But it, it really is, it, it amongst many other things, it really unpacks how this con works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this organization is a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's a bottomless pit of hypocrisy that manages to take people's idealism and weaponize it against them. And, uh, that, anyway, so I think it's an important book, and it's the reason that I'm writing it is to hold it's, myself. I'm super card. excited to. There's going to be so much inside information that no one's probably yeah, heard before. I, I can only imagine. Yeah. There's a lot of great conversations that happen, um, and I'm trying not to tell it all. On. Uh, yeah, you got to save some of it. Yeah, well, um, there's so much. I it's going to be hard. I, I don't think I possibly could. But um, so yeah, so getting back to, okay, so then here's what happened because we haven't told the whole story yet. So mm -hmm. what, what happens is I, we all, all the marketing guys, they disappear up to gold. And then later I'm invited up there. And I have no idea that the whole place was just a total disaster. And that's a whole other story. And I've written about it. But more importantly, they built these cottages. They built this little co village of cottages, which they called the G's. There was four of them were two-bedroom units. And one of them was a one-bedroom unit. They're very nice little units. And when I first went up to gold, I was living in, in one of the apartments that the staff lived in by mm -hmm. myself. They were like, I don't know, what, what, four or six to an apartment. I don't remember, like two or yeah, three married usually, couples. Well, it depends if you, yeah, if you were in a two bedroom, that would be three married couples because there would be one that would live in the living room. I, I was right. chatting with Sterling about it because he and I were roommates. So my, my uh, ex-wife and I, we lived in one uh, room, another couple lived across from us and then Sterling and his... Uh, ex-wife Suzette, who's Shelly Miscavige's sister, right. lived in the living room and they had put up this like, you know, the really thin plywood that you use on the sets, that ultra thin. Yeah, it's um, called, I forgot the name of it, but it's like backing yeah. board or something. It's, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. a really, it's, it's like a veneer. It right. It's just barely thicker than veneer. It has just enough structure to stand up as long as you connect it to it's some sort of boards. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that was the wall of their room, which. <laughs> There's no, like, there's no privacy or soundproofing in here no, or anything like no. that. Anyway, that's a whole nother funny story that Sterling and I get into, but this is how yeah. we were living. And you must've been in one of those apartments kind of. Yeah, uh, I was in, I don't remember which complex, but you know, they, I was in one of those apartments. I was there by myself, but I hated it because I was driving from LA, you know, mm -hmm. an hour and a half. And then I was driving 20, about 20 minutes to the apartment from the base back and forth every day. And it was just all mm -hmm. of a sudden it was insane. It was too much. Yeah. I, I know I'm being selfish because obviously I wasn't, I had it way better than the crew had it. So then they were finished. They finished this, 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 this little VIP village. Uh, I don't know how else to call it. And um, so then I was the first one to move in there. And then later Danny Sherman moved into one of them. He's another. Mm -hmm. And then, then Tom Cruise was then staying there during the time he was there. He was my neighbor for a while. And, and, and Rosemary was the housekeeper. So she must have been Tom's housekeeper for a while as well then. She, she she might have been. I don't yeah, I know she was down there for a bit. I don't know if the years where she was because she was in charge working down there taking care of those units for about and this is after the thing with Ronnie happened and she got in right, trouble. She was right. then once she was off of her restriction status that lasted several months, she was put down there as the housekeeper for him. Um, right. to take care of the celebrities. And it was about a four and a half year period. There may have been overlap there. I'd have to ask her specifically, but um at some point, I know that Bonnie View had finished, and they might have started right. putting Tom up there when he. Oh came yeah, no, no, no. As soon as it was finished, there. As soon as yeah. Bonnie View was finished, he was gone from the G's. That was that. We, we never saw. You'd hardly ever see him, and, and I think probably most of the time he came up, he was living up at Bonnie View because they had some really spectacular uh, VIP quarters up there. Uh, mm -hmm. Just stuff so, yeah, that's just it, over the top. Yeah, yeah, but so I would see Rosemary all the time because she was my housekeeper, and and that seemed to be a pretty decent job because you know you're down there, you're all by yourself. 
she's working mm. up. There's nobody ordering around, and you're just taking care of these units. And and you know you have to do some laundry and stuff, but they all had washers and dryers in them, so it was really easy to you know the job w was easy. Uh, so yeah, we, it was. She was just this pleasant person that was like the okay. housekeeper. I'd known her from L.A. and when she was mm -hmm. running secretary, and now she was a housekeeper. And it it just all seemed so normal. And when you talked about there was some information control on my end, that was definitely like Rosemary going to the RPF, all that kind of stuff um, would be in, in that in that that dossier of information control that I was kept right. from. Right. Because at one point, you know, you're just said, Hey, she's reassigned to somewhere else is probably what you're, you're told oh, yeah. someone else is put in there to take care of you guys. And you're busy, busy anyway. So you, it's not like you have a lot of time to think about it. Yeah, you don't, um, you absolutely don't. You're, you're pinned down, man. It's just like the bullets are flying right over your head. You have deadlines. You need to focus on what right. you're doing. You're not thinking she, about. She's told me a lot of stories about both taking care of you. Uh -oh. um, I remember you would be up there. Uh, yeah. Well, you would be up there sometimes and you would be, uh, because they didn't only use you as a director. Sometimes they would have you writing scripts and yeah. treatments and all sorts of stuff. Right. I think you were, you know, you would be doing that sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, she would take care of Danny Sherman and he was constantly going back and forth between whatever that biography project is. And then, you know, writing whatever these Ron mags were and the events and, right. um, I always remember Danny as uh, sort of like the uh, friendly uncle that everybody, it was kind of a little bit eccentric yeah. and um, Rosemary, she told me that um, Danny's wife had come up because I think she had a terminal illness and she ended up passing Yeah, and she was still there taking care of him during that time. And then shortly after that, I think is when she ended up in um, 2004, when she was sent to that PAC RPF, that rehabilitation thought conditioning camp again for the crimes of the thing that happened with ronnie right um but yeah so i my memory of danny and her memory of danny was you know similar to you know mitch just kind of this good-natured guy danny was always kind of his own is eccentric self yeah but, um yeah i guess that changed a little over time yeah it did danny yeah we were very good friends though i mean the days you're talking about they're sort of like the halcyon days at gold you know sort of the early 90s um, Dave was successful. I think like, I didn't know it. I came up around January, February, 1990, right around the time that he had, you know, beat the crap out of Mark Fisher in the garage. I mm -hmm. didn't know about that. Like that stuff was really just starting, uh, when I got up there and there was me and there was Danny and we we're living in this nice VIP quarters. And we had these, these, you know, great people like Rosemary. And then the other people that were taking care of us were really nice. Uh, and it was only like later when things really started to spiral out of control. You left in 2004. So I left in late 2003 and then really? Rosemary a couple. And then, you know, I think Ronnie and Biddy at this point were already gone in 2003. Right. They had left right. the Sea Org. Right. Um, but then in 2004, there was like a, a mass exodus where they kicked people off of that. Right, at international base and Golden Era Productions, and she got swept up in all of that. Right, and they sent them to RPF in LA, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they I just like kicked them out on the street. Some people, yeah, yeah, some people, yeah, they just offloaded them, as they say. What a wonderful term! You know, you Be can they really call it beaching. Beaching? Or are you yeah. talking the RPF? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm saying offload. Like they have, they have a a procedure where you can be fitness boarded out, which they refer to as offloading, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, they do. I, yeah. I mean, beaching, I, I, I think that's sort of the slang and naval See, naval. Yeah. yeah the naval like, term for it. Like they're going to throw you on a beach, like on a deserted Island and just leave. Yeah. You there. And I think it comes from the, the, from the ship, but the terms that I was most familiar with offloaded, oh, somebody got offloaded. It means they, you know, they just got rid of them. But I remember Miscavige saying to me one day, like, why do we have an RPF at gold? Like it looks bad. Like the optics are bad. So, and the next thing you know, they loaded up a number of buses with people and they all ended up in the what the pack RPF beating the RPF that was located around the big blue building. So it's just like crazy. Oh, so there's some amazing stories and she and I have started to kind of catalog these when they were not amazing in that, how shocking they are when they were on that RPF and pack the living conditions you're talking about yeah. literally hundreds of people that were there and there might be a one or two seater toilet for 200 people. Oh, and God. like, and it was disgusting. Like the, some of the stories I'm like, you just, anyway, prison, 
uh, by comparison in terms of the facilities available to you, even though you probably are restricted um, by the bars and things around you and those bars right, are not right. physically there, but you still are kind of restricted in a similar manner. Sounds like it was way better equipped than any of the living conditions for these people. And the, the, the staff members who weren't in trouble, their living conditions aren't much better than that. No, yeah, there's no place good, good place to live at PAC, especially back then. So I can't even yeah. imagine what it was like being in the RPF. I mean, it's just, you know, and they, you know, Hubbard talks about Earth as being a prison planet. I mean, come on. And then, you know, he does that. So, yeah. Just, so just to prove it to, just to prove that Earth is a prison planet, let me just show you. Let's What's double down on it. Terrible. Yeah. So yeah, Danny uh, became uh, sort of infamous as the official L. Ron Hubbard bi biographer, and mm -hmm. he used he used to write speeches for. Uh, he used to write all the events. He'd write speeches, all of David Miscavige's speeches, and then he would write these things called uh, the uh, L. H. L. Ron Hubbard bio, and then he would get up at, uh, at international events and do these things. And then after Danny's wife died, he, he kind of really spiraled and. He, he himself got very ill and ended up becoming an opioid addict. And it was really, you know, as I said, Scientology is like this bottomless pit of hypocrisy. You know, one example of that was like, you know, Dan Sherman is addicted, you know, the official Elrich biographer, he's addicted to opiates. He's doing events high on Oxycontin and pumped up on steroids. And he's giving speeches about all what Scientology does to help the opioid, uh, you know, ep epidemic. It's just like, it's just crazy stuff. I mean, eventually he got off, you know, I was, I, I was asked to kind of be his twin, like his partner and helping him get off of drugs. So, and then he passed away last year, but it was just like, you know, the outcomes that people have, you know, Danny was not a bad guy, um, yeah. but, but, you know, he raised so much money for the church and it's just the outcomes people have, you know, I mean, I'm not getting into it now at this point, but my own personal physical health and mental health became suffered so badly. It's like your trajectory with that organization, it's never going to be good. There's, there's no good outcome. You know, I talk about the early days at, at, at celebrity center when I got in and I was a, you know, a 23 year old film school dropout addicted to heroin and, this small group of wonderful people under Yvonne Gench literally like saved my life. But that was a fluke. That's not something, there's nothing in Scientology that, that we could all go back to and make that happen. That was mm -hmm. a fluke. It's, it's literally written into the DNA of Scientology that that is the trajectory, you know, yeah. and ultimately it's, you know, there's going to be a reckoning for David Miscavige. His ultimate outcome is going to be really horrific. There's no other potentiality, even if it's just him alone in a room going insane and then dying. Even if it's just that, even if it's not in prison, or even if he's not killed at the hand of his victims, it, it's it's not going to be a good outcome. There is no good outcome. No, he's, he's definitely not the kind of person who I... Uh... Uh, and my interactions with him were never uh, on a level where I, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I've been in the military for 20 years. Right. I've deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq uh, a total of five times for probably a total of 52 to 53 months of combat wow. time. So um, I'm a helicopter pilot and I've, I've done a lot of very amazing things, but at the same time, there's a lot of very traumatic things that I've been through. Right. Uh, at one point um, I was shot down. Uh, by an wow. enemy RPG and we were shot out of the sky. We were able to, we were on fire. We were able to put it down and land um, and get everyone out safely. And we had no loss of life, but it was a very traumatic event. It was the most traumatic thing that I've ever been through. And um, when, when you're in a situation like that, what starts to happen is you have such a rush of adrenaline that your vision and your memory becomes very uh, segmented. Like my normal memories are very fluid. They, they're sort of like a motion picture, but very, very high stress situations, they almost become little snapshots and color and texture and memory, they 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 do weird things and, and then you just have these little snippets all the time. So we went through this entire event, we got everyone back, everyone survived. We had some minor injuries, but we, but, even though it was a bad thing that happened, we had a good outcome, but it was extreme trauma. There was a fire. There were people that were hurt. We were able to get everyone kind of rounded up and all that. But through the end of this, we got back and um, 
the first night that I, once we were done with everything, I went to sleep and my, my thoughts were so troubled while I was sleeping, but do you know what I was having dreams about? It wasn't about the shoot down. I was having dreams of being back at Golden Era Productions, not about the combat situation that I was in. So any, any bad dreams that I've ever had, I've never had anything that related to the life that I chose for myself, even though there might be trauma related to it. And I've been able to, you know, go to counseling, uh, that the military has helped me with and be able to process this, to be able to grow from these things. But whenever I have a bad dream or whenever I have something that usually bothers me, it's about my early childhood or the time that I spent at Golden Era Productions. It's not about what you would expect it to be. Now, I know there's people that have had much more traumatic things happen and the physical injuries that, you know, are are severe to the point of, you know, debilitating and they have extreme post-traumatic stress disorder uh, about those combat incidents. But for me, where my mind went back to was these earlier events that happened. And I call them Dave dreams. And I've talked to people. It's like, <laughs> hey, are, how are, are you still having Dave dreams? And like, well, you know, I keep a little journal and it kind of helps fucking everybody that worked for that guy has a Dave dream. I 100% think that that is true. Wow. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. And it's one of the things, as much as I feel that I had a, a unique window into the Sea Org and I worked with Sea Org members, I had Sea Org members who were my bosses. I had Sea Org members who were my, who worked under me. As much as I think that, I think everybody I know, and now including you, talks about these dreams. I never had one. Those aren't the dreams that I have. So I, mm. I think that to some degree, I I, I am missing some ass, uh, uh, some insight. But dreams, you don't know. You know, I tell you, I had a funny thought, Mike. Right. You know how immunity works, right? Like how inoculation works, mm. right? You you get a little yeah. bit of that thing to build your immunity. Maybe those days at at gold, and, and I, I don't mistake me that I'm saying there's something positive about it. Oh, I know where I'm you're not, going with this. I agree. Yeah, that they sort of inoculated you a little bit. So that against that trauma, so that maybe some of your other your 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 you know your crewmates on the helicopter who might have not had that weren't inoculated against the kind of trauma. You yeah, uh, I, I think that that's probably true. And I've also just found different people have different tolerances for stress. Yeah, this is true. I mean, they don't understand. I mean, you know, I ended up with a sleep disorder, a very serious sleep disorder, a trauma-based sleep disorder, uh, which I identify as a product of working at Gold. And, and a lot of service people who were young and fit came back from Iraq, came back from combat, combat with this same kind of sleep disorder. And it's 100% trauma-based. So, but mm. not everybody gets it. It really depends on a lot of things. It's just, you know, yeah. not, not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. I mean, it's just like. Right. There's a, there's, a, there's gotta be genetic components. Um, there's just, yeah. you know, every, everybody's different. Yeah. So, but um, for me, the, um, the the endeavor of being in the military has been the most physically demanding thing that I've ever done. I'm and sure. um, and you know just the different types of training and then just the events that I've been in, but it hasn't been as emotionally demanding as the life that I came from before. So in many respects, the the hardest thing for people to overcome is their mental right. mental blocks, and those things are the harder barriers than the physical because if like if you're out of shape or if you're struggling to do certain things, if you do it for long enough, your body gets into shape. And as long as you're mentally going after it, your body will get there. Uh, you know, in some instances that doesn't work for everybody, but when you're in that situation, your body kind of adapts. It's, you know, it's, it's an organism that is able to change based off of the situation it finds itself in, but mentally is the biggest thing to get after. So when I was already like, I went into it with the thing, thinking that the military is in terms of some of these situations of like somebody yelling at you is like, that's not that bad. Like, this is like, Hey, these are rookie numbers. You're going to have to pump these numbers up a little bit. Like, you know, like that whole yeah. thing is like, Hey, this sh like, and, and then I can see some people around me. They're like this. And I was like, okay, like maybe it'll get a little bit worse. And there were things that were very, very hard, but the mental aspect of it for me, I think I was already expecting something that was, I was expecting it to be way worse than it actually was. But right. then I just had to meet the physical portion portion of it, right. and, which is the easier of the two, right. I would say. Well, I would think also in the military, you're not being gaslit. Like, no, it is uh, the military and it's a different, different kind of conditioning. It is not for everybody. I'm going to tell yeah. you right now. And it is an organization 
which has a very specific mission and they um you, there's qualification things like if you have flat feet you can't be in the military if you right. have certain physical limitations if you have certain mental limitations they just won't take you so um but they uh, it's also very much a meritocracy like if you work hard right. and you put it in and again different people will have different experiences but from my experience you put in the hard work and you put forward the effort and you do the best that you can that you can do at something and the the majority of the time that's going to work out for you and you're going to move up at a very steady rate right. you'll never be rich off of being in military or you know kind of a public service kind of thing but you can live well and you can raise a family and you can have the life that you want to if it's right for you and for right. a lot of people it's not the right thing for them but for right. me it was and a lot of people get very valuable training that then uh oh absolutely yeah is is highly paid they they have high earning jobs in the private sector for me uh, and um, for me, I decided, Hey, I'm going to make a career out of this. It was mm -hmm. something that I wanted to do. And it was, it, it gave me the opportunity to do something that I love, but a lot of people will do service and they'll, they'll do whatever their in, initial enlistment is. And they'll get that job. Um, they'll get that on the job training. They'll then be able to move into the private sector and be very right. successful. doing. Yeah. I mean, there. I know more than one helicopter pilot who works in Hollywood doing a uh, motion picture aviation. They're making good money and you know, they're military trained. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Which actually well, it's expensive them, to learn how to fly a helicopter yeah, and sure. like have somebody do it for you. And then for them to pay you, it's like, well, I'm kind of, yeah. I'm doing what I love and you're paying me to do it. So I'm, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I yeah. do, I used to fly with one guy who specifically went into the forestry service to be trained as a, as a helicopter pilot because he wanted a job in the film business. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's absolutely. Uh, yeah. That does have, but you know, he did his service. It's totally legit. Um, so yeah, anyway, people love seeing pictures. So, uh, I have a picture of Sam here from the old days. Um, I thought you might like to see it or maybe you wouldn't, I don't know, but, um, yeah, it was a lifetime ago. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. I'm this sure. is, this is Sam. This is Sam on the left. Now, the reason this looks period is because we were shooting a film within a film. If you can look in the background and you can see this person wearing a blue t-shirt, so that's yeah. off the set, but we were, these okay. are costumes. We were mm -hmm. actually, she was playing a makeup artist in a period film that was supposed to take place in the forties. So, Interesting. So at least now you you can put a, everybody can put a face to it. And this was, you know, I have very little pictures from all of my years in Scientology because of the security. They really clamped down. Uh, you had to get rid of all photos. They confiscated everything. I have very little, but I did manage to get this picture of, of Danny of while Danny? he was still alive having breakfast uh, oh, wow. at my house. And oh, that's on the left, that's uh, Fleur. I think her last name was Thomason. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That's Lou's Fleur sister, Thomas. right? Mm -hmm. Remember her? Yes, Lou, I uh, 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 Dave's girlfriend, that would be her sister. And that other person is Danny's partner. So there's Dan. And there you go. Now you can have put something to that. I have, I have so little. It's amazing. So, But I yeah. think that pretty much, I think we've covered... Oh, we really much. have. I've enjoyed this conversation, Mitch. Yeah, really me too. You this, me on. It's it's my pleasure. Anytime uh, you want to, uh, I may think of some other things I want to ask you. So let, yeah, for let's, sure. uh, let's let's just cover some of these questions here. Okay, uh, for sure. First of all, I have a question. How many other people do you, this is from Ann Battles. Uh, how many other people do you think experienced SA and people were afraid to speak about it? The same reason your mom was. Your mom is so sweet. It is just so sweet. It is just that it happened. She is wonderful. Um, I, it's hard for me to give, I, I don't like to um, add conjecture, but I'll say that um, just anecdotally from other people that I've talked to there, there has been other instances of this. The thing that's so hard to put um, unless people share their stories and and I'm not saying that people have to share their stories. That is a very personal decision. Right. But no one speaks to each other there. You're not mm -hmm. allowed to share your opinions, your thoughts. Um, it's very much, um, Sterling makes this reference, uh, Sterling Tompkins, he has his own channel, but he says, being and working in the Sea Organization and in Scientology is like the novel uh, 1984. Right. And that is 100% true. So I know I call my channel um, Mike Brown 101, but in 1984, the 
uh, room 101 is where people go to get reprogrammed oh, in their right. thoughts. I wondered. I thought it was That's because... not why I call it that. It's because I was in the 101st Airborne. Um, oh, I thought or, you were the... Or maybe I, thought... I love Depeche Mode 101. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> oh, I'm please, all over the place. No more Depeche Mode, please. But yeah, we have Mark Headley for that. We have enough. <laughs> uh, he overran me on that years ago. I thought it was because you were the 101st Mike Brown to get a, a tag on YouTube. No, it's... I, no, those I was, are all uh, great. No, I love backstories. I was in the hundred and first. I was in the hundred and first airborne. Um, my last deployment. So I was like, you know what? This kind of is just going to be a, like, no, a little perfect. thing. No, that's perfect. No, if you know, you know. But the room one hundred and one thing for nineteen eighty four, that is what uh, it's room, like. Like, right. hey, we're going to make you believe things that aren't true mm -hmm. and make it hard for you until you finally decide that you're going to agree with illogic. Well, yeah, and that's exactly. what it's like there. Absolutely, a hundred percent. Do you remember? Okay, so one thing that occurred to me occurred to me, you know, you first leave Scientology and you're like, wow, that was stupid. And then, you know, the further away you get from it, the louder you start yelling, that was stupid. Until eventually mm -hmm. you're going, that was so stupid. Uh, but there's this thing when you're a quote unquote pre-clear and you're receiving auditing, you're not allowed to talk about your case, remember? In other words, right. the stuff that's going on with you. And that, would, and that would include abuse that would include that you're being made responsible for your, the abuse right. that has been right. perpetrated so on you. you believe that it is self damaging for you to be speaking about your case with anybody, but your auditor. And this is one of the ways I, I, I never realized this until recently. It's one of the ways they keep you isolated. You could literally get into ethics trouble by speaking about your case. If you were SA, that's your case. If you were doing right. something, that's your case. Just like that story that Rachel told, that guy that was talking to her about, yeah. you know, what he was doing with the children of families. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah. He was talking to her as an auditor. He couldn't talk to anybody. Yeah. And then um, the, the most probably salient examples of all of this are all of the Jane Doe's that spoke out against Masterson. Like they exactly. had to deal with this whole thing of like not being able to come forward and like, being gaslit and all this sort of stuff right. when they finally were. So that, that, that is part of the culture that this whole thing of me complaining, like there's not a process for a person to be able to come forward and actually like say, Hey, I need help. Something happened to me. That is 100% true. And there's, there's a growing number of instances of this and Rosemary's story is one of them and uh, the Jane Doe's and there's other people out there. And this is, mm -hmm. this is not a uniqueness. This is the culture of that organization. I guess the best answer to that question, because you can't put a number to it, is probably more than we all imagine. I imagine so. Yeah. It, it, I found as I dig deeper, like you said, that it's, and I made this analogy with Aaron, it's like that sham wow thing, but wait, oh, there's right. more. Right. right. Yeah, anyway. That guy like, was a Scientologist. Crap. He was. So funny. Yeah. From sham wow. Did you know that? I did. That's why yeah. I think it's hilarious too. Oh yeah. Yeah. It has a little subtext to it. Hey, here's a comment I want to read uh, from Catherine. Catherine Rosemary was too sweet for Scientology, but she did help others listen to how Mitch remembers her. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm not the only one that remembers her that way. This is just like common across the boards. She's just one of those people. Mike, here's something from you. This is from CeCe's Comfort Cooking. Hey CeCe. Uh, yeah. And by the way, I'll go visit her site uh she inspired me i i've got some cooking stuff i'm going to do i just haven't gotten around to it uh, and anyway her question is for mike who was the ed who was the ed at the boulder mission when your parents got into scientology so it was uh, uh martha wells and wow. uh, rex yeah so martha who was actually then ended up moving to los angeles her husband rex wasn't in the sea org i think he maybe had an lsd issue i don't know but Beckett Wells, I remember him. He was up at the Gold oh, Base. He was an electrician. Wait, these were well. Beckett was originally on the shoot crew. He was in the group. Right, department. but he was like his a mother. Right? Yeah, so he was. He's a couple years older than me. So he was kind of you know when I was about ten years old. Beckett was maybe thirteen or fourteen. Mm -hmm. He his mother Martha Wells uh, was the mission holder um, in Denver. Uh, that when my my family got into scientology back you know in 19 um maybe 85 86 time frame i right. think 86 and that was uh we were there and then when we then moved forward to los angeles and my mother joins the sea organization um martha is then working for guillaume laserve um uh in uh as i think one of his assistants in exec strata if i'm not yeah, mistaken. I, I didn't know her i certainly knew becca he was a character mm -hmm. absolutely um, love beckett 
Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then we have another question from Mike. Uh, this is from Purple Groovy sixty nine. Question from Mike Brown: Does your mom have an opinion about the whereabouts of Shelly M? Um, I think that she is. This is the thing when. So everyone kind of thinks she's probably at the CST base, and I can I right. tend to agree with that. Right. But I have an opinion about that, not from my experience in Scientology, because um, this the location of Church of Spiritual Technology, and it, if people come and go from there, anything like that, is such a tightly guarded secret within Scientology. It it is. I, I don't even know how to, it would, it would be like the most confidential levels of federal government that people don't even think exist and are all oh, yeah. like, area area. What is it? Area, area 51. Yeah. Area 51. Yeah. It would, they'd be like area 51. So that's what church of spiritual technology is like. So she's probably a consumer of this, uh, these videos and these questions and stuff very much like everyone else is because she knew Shelly because she was kind of plugged into that right. whole service. Right. Um, service thing there. Um, but I don't know that she has any opinion that's uh, any different than anybody else. I, I mean, I think that Shelly's probably at that CST property. Um, yeah, I have no doubt. I being ran kept into, happy as best they can. Well, yeah, I ran into her in 2008 in Redlands, which, you know, was on the way to the base. It's where, you know, you'd stop to have lunch. And yeah. if you, if you drive uh, the only road south from from Red, from uh, the that CST base for, uh, up in Big Bear, you, you're going to end up at Redlands. Redlands is a nice place to go to shop and have lunch and stuff. And I yeah, ran into yeah. there. I didn't know she was missing yet. She'd been missed gone for three years. But you know, like we talked about when Rosemary went to the RBF, people come and go for years, and you're like, oh, they got reassigned. They went to open up Russia or some other little mm -hmm. country or or a, a little country. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's yeah. I have no doubt uh, that she's up there. It's just I have I have to wonder, Mitch. The the chances of you running into her. Um, like, I'm sure that it, that's not something that she commonly goes like, hey, I'm going to go and have Chipotle. <laughs> no. She must have been out for some sort of medical appointment because she was with handlers, yeah. her friends. Oh, yeah. She was it, with, I know who she, I know. Antonella who and yeah. No, yeah. She was with Elsie Ben Ryan. It was then Ben Ryan. So the, was, I'm sure yeah. that it was such a, a colossal, like, dumpster fire of a flap that you ran into her i'm sure like it was reported <laughs> up we fucking ran into mitch like oh yeah, my well, god it, and mitch is like hey oh yeah totally <laughs> i was kind of like well you know whenever you run into uh staff members especially sea members especially from the base you run into them somewhere else and they're in so in, and they were all in uniform right they were dressed dre casual dressed their uniforms down you know they're like mm -hmm. um it's always that weird because it's a very out of context. Right. You run into them in a movie. Like people would say, I ran into David Miscavige in a movie in Hollywood Boulevard. And they're like freaking out. It's in, you know, he doesn't do that anymore. That was years ago. So mm -hmm. there was that awkwardness, but there was something else. And I didn't know it at the time that, that she was, you know, under, uh, extreme under super, yeah, under mm -hmm. extreme supervision. Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, they looked at me. So I had to go over and say, hi, and it was just, it was very casual, chatty. How you doing? Good. And then it was kind of like one of them, I don't remember. I think it was, uh, it was Ann, uh, formerly Rathbun, said, mm -hmm. so what are you doing here? And it was just a little. Oh, she's, the second she gets back, like I bet the second you walked out, she was on a cell phone saying, we just ran into Mitch. And, and I said, oh, I, I'm Shelly on my way. was to hungry the... and we had to get her something to eat, like on the way back from a doctor's yeah. appointment. And we yeah. ran into freaking Mitch. Like, what are, well, like, they, oh my God. See, they seem to calm down as soon as I said, oh, I'm on my way to the base. I stop here every Monday for lunch. <laughs> then they realized I wasn't part of some, you know, right. that I wasn't tailing them. Right. So anyway. Yeah. But, oh, I guarantee there's a, there's a report somewhere about that occurrence. Oh, there's yeah, no doubt in my mind because that was, I guarantee a problem. Yeah. Uh, Even uh, though I, you were just like, ah, whatever. Yeah. I never heard about it. I mean, never came up. People were just fine to leave it alone. Cause mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't talking about it. Uh, so anyway, so wow. I think, uh, there's that. Okay. We got that. Let me see if we got anything, uh, anything here, other questions, if anybody has, and then before we bring this to a controlled landing, um, which I guess is more, even more pertinent with having a helicopter pilot as a guest. I, I often say we'll bring this to a controlled landing, but, for That's a good stake. saying. I like, yeah. I'm a big fan of that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, oh, you know, any, any landing you can walk away from is a good one, right, Mitch? Yeah. Well, if you, you know, can I, use the aircraft again, it's even better. 
<laughs> right. Right. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. As long as you're doing the taxpayers a favor then, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can remember, you know, I was always, I flew a lot for work, right? Uh, you know, uh, for aviation cinematography, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then after a while, I got, so I just didn't like it. So I'd send up like an A cam or I'd send somebody else up. And then, you know, we, we use those little, uh, those little uh, like aviation band walkie talkies to communicate right. from the ground to blah, blah, blah. So I would just stay in the ground. But for, at first it's fun. And then, you know, you get to know some pilots. I worked with a guy who was actually married to a Scientologist, a guy named Peter McKernan, who's one of the more famous motion picture helicopter pilots. Yeah, he did all the, the diehards and he did like, his list of credits is just like insane. Hmm. And uh, I learned a very important lesson from Peter. I'm just, we're, we're, over, we're over time, but I think you're gonna appreciate this as a helicopter sure. instructor, because you know this, you're gonna go, oh yeah, of course. We were, we were going back to Palm Springs from uh, Joshua Tree, right? Yucca Valley. And so you fly over this cliff, right? It's a cliff. And all of a sudden yeah. you're like, you're 200 feet off the ground and then you're 1,500 feet off the ground, just like that, boom. And you can see the airport to the right, right? And then off to the left. Uh, but for some reason, the pilot turns to the left. Peter turns to the left. And then he goes straight and then he turns to the right. And I'm like, what's happening? Because you talk a lot about what you know, with the, it's boring you're sitting there with a the pilot it's just you yeah. and him and a cameraman in the back and so you just right. chat and you know uh, and i was fascinated by the what they do flying helicopters right and he said oh well you always you always cross the tower at the wire right now you know this you know what exactly mm -hmm. what that means mm -hmm. we're 1500 feet off the ground right there's no wires for 1500 feet yeah and yet he looked down there and he saw two towers and mm -hmm. he turned it's high tension wires yeah high tension wire towers and he turned to the closest tower which was away from the airport flew over the tower and then changed his heading to the airport and i yeah. said but i don't understand there's no chance you're gonna hit that wire and he just looks at me and he says you always cross at the tower absolutely like so that that's one thing that is built into aviation and you know that's if you look at it um kind of on a little tangent, but this is interesting. Aviation as a profession has some of the best um, statistics in terms of mishaps, but whenever something right. happens, it's a significant event. Right. And then there's a lot of learning that goes into it after that. So there's things that we do as a matter of course, like the, you, you, you'll you do these checklists every single time right. on how you do the run-ups and right. how you do the shutdowns and the right. things that you do and the procedures that you do. If you've done them a million times, you do it every single time as though it's the first time ever. You try to keep it fresh in your mind because those little attention to details and basics right. matter. So if you start getting lazy about it at high altitude, well, when you're lower and then you start and you're not paying the same level of respect right. to the things that can constantly kill you, you start to get sloppy. And when you get, yeah. so there's, yeah. there's old pilots, there's bold pilots, but right. there's no yeah. old bold pilots. Right. Yeah. You know, he, cause yeah, then Peter said to me, he said, well, where do you draw the line? Like he said, if you start compromising that rule, you're going to keep pushing it closer and closer 100%. and closer and eventually you're going to die. And I walked away from that uh, thinking, that I had learned this great life lesson that when it comes to people's lives, you follow the rules because this, we're talking, these are, it's a life and death situation. People's lives mm -hmm. are at risk. And in those situations, you hold to that standard. You never compromise it. So, Hey, I learned that from a helicopter pilot, Mike. And I, I believe go. Peter was military. It's trained, good stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you know that you can apply that to a lot of things, but when I go up and I fly by myself because I do civilian flying just for fun sometimes. Right. And I'm usually always with a crew. So I'm with another pilot. We have a flight engineer, multiple crew, depending on what mission right. we're doing. And I'm constantly talking. Everything's verbalized. You say it, you get a response. There's this almost right. like this banter, this pattern right. that you go through all the time. Right. Yeah, well, we've when seen I'm it in the out movies. There, right. But when I'm out there by myself, I'm literally talking to myself out loud. I'm not doing oh, it wow. in my head. I'm talking. Like, right. bah, 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 bah. And I, I was looking around. I'm like, I am literally talking to myself. And I'm like, and I love it because I'm getting exactly yeah. what, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, but, it, but, it's but it, that's just how it works. Yeah. You're yeah. maintaining that standard of safety. Okay. Absolutely. That's, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, okay. Hold on. I got another, I got something here for me. Uh, this from Adora Explora. Thank you for the super chat. Mitch in the seventies, I had the same addiction as you. I kicked it cold 
but I shudder to think what may have happened if Scientology would have been around in northern BC. Well, you know what? It wasn't, and here we are. So absolutely, yeah. So uh, awesome, no, Dora. No, yeah, no need to shudder. And congratulations on your recovery. Uh, I'm assuming, like me, you walked away from addiction and never looked back. Uh, that's a whole other story. I'm not even going to get into it because while I recovered in the midst of Scientologists and Scientology in the final analysis, that had nothing to do with it. It was just a matter of where I was at. Okay, good. So moving right along, I think we're done. No more questions. I think we need to wrap this up here. So Mike, uh, I want to thank, I have to find my outro. Uh, okay, good. There it is. So listen, Mike, thanks. Good luck. Let's do this again. I'm looking Absolutely. forward to, to seeing, watching your progression as speaking out and hearing more about Rosemary. And when you see her, please tell her I said hello. Well, there's a very good possibility she's watching you right now. Oh, fantastic. Hello, <laughs> Rosemary. It's, I hope you are. If you're not, watch this later and know that I remember you fondly. And with that, we're going to go. Bye, guys. <laughs> Oh! Oh! Oh!